Welcome everybody to tonight's uh, Hump Day Hanger presentation sponsored by supercup.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. A um, couple things going on. Uh, first, if you are a supercup.org member or not, we're right in the middle of our calendar campaign. We have some really super cool calendars that are have been printed and are now being bound. And uh, that's we give those away with memberships if you're not familiar. And so our annual membership drive is going on and uh, sending out these really groovy aviation calendars. And you can see all about those on www.supercub.org. There's a link on the homepage. So you might want to check that out. Uh, so next week, um, I don't have a firm plan yet, but I'm planning to make a plan. Um, I did, uh, good news, I did actually was in the same location as Bill Rusk today, for those who know him. And he is working on another presentation for us. Uh, we joked a little bit because the weather in Alaska was terrible today that all of his slides were just going to be clouds. But uh, I think uh, actually he's working on something that'll be pretty cool. So that'll be upcoming, probably not next week, but, uh, but before too long. But uh, tonight uh, uh, we're doing a program on the basics of aircraft preheating. And that's being presented by Doug, Doug Evink. Am I pronouncing your name right, Doug? Yes. Well, Okay, good. <laughs> Doug Evink, he's the president and owner of Tannis Aircraft Products, which is the world's leading manufacturer of preheat and preconditioning systems for the aviation industry. Prior to purchasing Tannis, Evink was the president and chief operating officer of the Palin Kimball Company. He also held management positions with Johnson Controls and the Maytag Corporation. In addition to his professional career, Evink is active in the community and he has served on the boards of several organizations, including Minnesota Aviation Trades Association, CEO Roundtable, Minnewaska Lake Association, and Avivio. Doug enjoys hunting, fishing, golfing, and supports causes that restore wetlands and provide habitat for wildlife. Welcome, Doug. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to turn it right over to you so you can take off. All right. Uh, one of the things Steve and I talked about just before, normally we are doing these things all in person and welcome to 2020, we've heard that many times, but there will be some audience participation. Steve has warned me that I may tip my toe into very deep water, but be close to your keyboards. And of course, this is for only the people that are on Zoom. Uh, there will be some times I ask a question and the first person to type their name in to the chat box will be the winner of uh, various types of swag. Some of them uh, worth it, some of them maybe not. So with no further ado, and if you have questions, put them in the chat box. Obviously, Steve Miller mentioned that. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted during the presentation because a lot of times there's a slide that'll go along with the question. So I will pop over to share the screen and... Here we go. Oh, yeah, we just showed a picture of the uh, of part of the swag to start with, too. So that's uh, trouble. So uh, first of all, thanks, Steve, Laura, and the uh, whole supercub.org organization. As I first screen says, supercub.org and Tannis product, uh, Aircraft Products presents. I feel it's like an intro to a movie, but the lack of trade shows, uh, this is something that we really enjoy doing and spending time with all of you. So I'm gonna be covering the basics of aircraft preheating, some Tannis aircraft products history, uh, some of the things that we're working on that you maybe had no clue of what we're working on. And I uh, hope there's a pretty good dialogue at the end of questions because I just, when I do these presentations, I try to keep on improving them with uh, the questions that come from all of our customers and the products that we have is really an outcoming of our customers saying, hey, what about this? What about this? So the basics of aircraft preheating, the why, when, what, and how to preheat. I always start off by uh, putting in the uh, slide that you're seeing here that has a, at that time, a brand new Cirrus aircraft being landed on Lake uh, Mille Lacs in the central part of Minnesota and uh, it'll be probably the first weekend in March right after ice fishing ends. We had a thing called Iceport. Uh, maybe some of the people that are on have seen that. Uh, great customer of ours is Cirrus. Another one on the right hand side, you'll see the Ericsson Skycrane 
is a more recent customer. Four or five years ago, we developed a system for them to be able to have all of the uh, engines and such preheated prior to flight. And I don't know if all these red marks are going on my screen or not. Uh, and that's in the northern part of Canada. So here's where it starts with some interaction to uh, start with. First of all, the day is Veterans Day. And uh, I, for one, and everyone here at TANIS want to give our gratitude and thanks to all the veterans that may be on here. And if you are, there's time to get very close to your chat box and type in your name. And the first person to get that is not only the people that we are very thankful for, that you are the ones that have given us the freedom we have, but you'll get one of these wonderful little items here. Uh, and it's up to you whether you want the hoodie or the jacket or the Bluetooth uh, speaker, that is up to you. And let me make one change here. Okay. Uh, Steve, a, a nod up or down. Are you seeing red marks over your presentation? Uh, let me do one other thing. Let's, uh, I'm going to stop a share here a minute and go back into this. Sorry, we got to note that the YouTube wasn't working. We had this problem one other time and I'm kind of working to get that going. So, <clears throat> so in the worst case scenario, in the worst case scenario, it's getting recorded and so it'll get, uh, it'll get moved over there. So those marks could either be from Zoom or from PowerPoint. They are gone now. Yep. Okay. So there we go. Whoever hits it into the chat window, I'll let Laura tell me whoever that wonderful person is. Put your name. If you're a veteran, Slot your name down and uh, your email address. There was an answer there, Laura, or not? Tell me Dave Schlinker. Dave Schlinker. Okay. S-C-H-L-E-N-K-E-R. He's, right. he's the man with the speedy keyboard. He is. And then I will, uh, if you want to make sure there's an email address, I will get that from Laura later on and we'll get in touch. You can pick your pick, but cement those in your mind. There might be more of these that might be available for some folks. So uh, a little bit about Tannis Aircraft Products. Uh, we have two facilities. Our, we're actually headquartered in Blaine, Minnesota, which is the Minneapolis-St. Paul suburb. It's right next to the Anoka County Airport where a lot of activity happens. That's where our sales, engineering, and a little bit of manufacturing uh, accounting takes place. And the, that facility looked like that four weeks ago. And of course, I was brave enough and instructed someone to go on our Facebook page and saying, hey, it's Tannis preheat weather. And not only did it do that, about three, four days later, we got another uh, several inches of snow and it stayed there for quite a while. So we're, we're a little bit more selective when we talk about what is Tannis type aircraft weather. Our manufacturing site, is uh, has been in Glenwood, Minnesota since the uh, uh, late 80s. And that is the airport. And uh, if I can get my pen to work, you'll see this facility here, here is where the manufacturing is done. And we have uh, basically all of our products other than anything that we might be r and ding over in Blaine is manufactured there, shipped out of there. So you'll see things that uh, uh, we'll say Glenwood, Minnesota and a lot of our old advertising and documents that are out there do talk about Glenwood, Minnesota. Oshkosh, we didn't have this year, but we always like to uh, make sure there's some involvement there. As the sign says, Tannis can preheat anything that flies and some things that shouldn't. Uh, that was when you, when you give your employees a suggestion of what should we add to the green space at Oshkosh, uh, that's when you see, and, and oh, by the way, these are working products. They just took stuff off the assembly line and, and made a, uh, an interesting added flight item for our uh, display there. And for those that, that we've met over there, we uh, hope to be there again in 2021 with uh, any new products and things that we were working on. This was a snapshot of uh, now almost two years ago and that's the weather at the airport where I'm sitting right now in Glenwood. When you see this, you better have Tannis installed is what 
we always tell folks. Uh, minus 36, uh, you know, the other thing that I do tell people is, hey, but, you know, the relative humidity, because here's where people get in trouble and it's going to come up in our presentation a little bit later, that's 75% uh, relative humidity. You know, so you, even though it's 36 degrees, 75%. Now remember that's percent, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Why to preheat? And we're, I'm not going to read all these verbatim, but these are things that Pete Tannis, the founder of Tannis Aircraft Products, that's the name, he uh, founded the company back in the early 1970s. So we have a 50th birthday coming up here pretty soon. And he did it for a couple of these, and then we've added to that uh, over the years. And really since, uh, since we got, I got involved in 2012, we've had a lot of uh, interesting new ventures into other areas. So to reduce engine wear, uh, obviously to be able to start the engine is something that we are always looking at. We wanna make sure that the battery is heated so that you can start the engine, you have the cranking amps capability. And for several years now, the battery isn't necessarily forward of the firewall. Uh, we've seen them tucked away in the tail and various other places. So when you would preheat your engine, normally you'd get a little extra heat and warmth coming from the preheat system to add that heat to the battery. But now battery so many times after the firewall. So we develop a battery heat that goes along with our preheat system. Frosting of plugs is a big issue when you get in those shoulder area times right around freezing. Uh, we also sell our product to open cockpit uh, folks and radial engines. It reduces the warm up time, warming up the oil, warming up the engine. So that, that is a, a large goal. Uh, cylinder scoring and people I'm sure have seen the uh, demonstrations where you have a tapered cylinder and when it's cold, like the minus 36 that you saw there earlier, those clearances become very, very tight. And then when you have uh, gas being ignited, it expands, all the metal expands at different rates. And that different rate of expansion can really cause issues. And we've all talked about the making of metal, which we don't like to see. We wanna make sure that you have proper oil flow. You notice I didn't say pressure. Uh, seeing oil pressure when you start up when it's really cold doesn't mean you have oil flowing through all of the items that you want to have the oil, crankcase cl clearances and anything, any critical driveline component, whether it be a mod motor, fuel control units, uh, you'll see the helicopter. We, we have expanded our product line greatly in the rotowing side of the world. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that tonight, supercup.org. Uh, I'm sure several people have have uh, he probably have helicopters too. You'll see some of our uh, pictures that you'll see here later on will be related to rotor wing, but uh, that is a real big part of our uh, presentation and our product lineup. And a, a, a guilty plug next week, Tuesday, the Airborne uh, Pilot uh, Aviation Group has a Tech Tuesday talk, and we're gonna be talking more about the rotor wing side there if anyone is interested. Last but not least, uh, the engine manufacturers actually mandate preheating at certain temperatures. Sometimes it's a combination of things, uh, but really whenever you're getting, uh, whether you're Lycoming, Continental, various other engine manufacturers, once you're getting in the 20s, they're going to say, if you read the engine manual, you will see that it says you, you must preheat. So what are our goals of preheating? And I know there's, I'm sure that one of the biggest questions that everyone's gonna ask is, uh, hey, can I leave this thing plugged in all the time? And is it gonna make moisture and all that? We're gonna address that. But first of all, these are Tannis' goals of preheating, not necessarily the industry, but when we look at a new engine, uh, I was just looking at a uh, UL power engine that's in our hangar right now. This is what we start with. That's our, when we see a whiteboard, this is our drawing board. We want to see the cylinder head temperature at least 50 degrees above ambient. You know what I'm saying? Above ambient and keep that in the back of your mind. We want to see the crankcase or noise case and so at least 40 degrees above the ambient. We want to produce an oil temperature of at least 40 degrees above, you know, and I'm talking about Fahrenheit, above ambient. 
but you should not exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And you never want to see your oil temp warmer than your cylinder temp. And here's where we're going to jump into the weeds a little bit. Uh, I say think dew point, and here's a caution. Uh, here comes some physics, and this will get into your question about, well, what happens if I leave it plugged in all the time, etc. First of all, the physics, water evaporates at any temperature. The uh, glaciers in Alaska are evaporating. Uh, everything has uh, a, any type of moisture is evaporating at any temperature. The rate that evaporates is the delta, is the difference between what's the temperature of that moisture and what is the ambient dew point temperature. The greater that spread, when you make that delta larger, the evaporation rate speeds up. So for those of us that are in the Midwest or further north than that, you know, you think of a wet washcloth left in your house in the summertime, you know, and it stays wet for a while, especially if the humidity is up there. But in the wintertime, you know, all of a sudden it's dry really quickly. That's the concept of the delta being larger. And of course, when you're preheating, you're aiding in that delta. So that's where some of this uh, conversation starts going about, well, how should I preheat? What should I preheat? What's the best method of preheating? So here's our statement. Our complete multi-point preheat system keeps the cylinder head, basically everything that's above your oil line, warmer than the oil. And of course, the, your engine really has its own little environment. Uh, if you leave it set in your hangar and unheated hangar, you know, it's gonna become equal or close to the ambient, but it's not gonna rise and fall exactly the way the temperature in your hangar does or the dew point in your hangar could be different. And when you're done flying that engine, your, your dew point is very, very high, uh, probably 180, 170 degrees, relative humidity almost at 100%. But we've designed that multi-point preheat system so that you can, if you want to, leave your system plugged in all the time. And we're gonna go through some information that you can do these tests yourself and you'll see we talk about this later on. So what am I talking about? You know, first of all, here's our ambient temperature line running across the bottom. And again, you can do, you know, remember we said above ambient. This was a customer that uh, wanted to do a test and it was the middle of summertime. You see the, the ambient temperature is 70, almost 70 degrees, 65 degrees. We can still do these tests because it doesn't make a difference if it's 70 degrees or 20 degrees, the amount of heat that we add is going to raise it above that ambient. And here's the critical part that we want, uh, that I want all of the people that are on here tonight or to look at this later on. We heat up the cylinders very quick because they're smaller. They don't have the heat, they don't have the mass of the amount of oil in your crankcase. So you'll see, we jump that up from, it's almost 70 degrees. We get up to 125, uh, 120, 125 degrees in a period of time that's, uh, here's an hour right here. So our system, about an hour, hour and a half, without any air blowing around, will get those cylinders up that warm, that quick. But you'll see there's a lag here in your oil. Of course, the reason there's a lag is we have a mass there, a larger mass. Uh, this, I think, had six quarts, seven quarts of oil. So it takes a little bit longer for that to heat up. And you'll see that it ramps up slower because of the mass. This is what we always want to see. We want to see a delta. We want the top of that aircraft engine. We want everything that's above the oil line to be warmer than the oil because your oil, the, you know, the moisture is, is down below, is down the bottom of your sump. You know, that's starting to evaporate. And that evaporation process, once it hits something that is colder than the dew point. And the dew point is going to be pretty darn close to your oil temperature when you're inside of a crankcase. Once it does that, it's going to condense, just like dew on your windscreen or any place else. If that item is warmer than the dew point, and here we've got almost 25 degree delta, it's a physic constant. You cannot have that moisture condense on that item. And this is the reason why we say, if you're gonna plug it in, you plug it in, 
and you keep it plugged in until you fly. And that's really where Tannis started saying, hey, you can leave it plugged in all the time in case the weather turns, just leave it plugged in because it's better to do that. And I know I don't have this in my deck, but you know, if you were to plug it in and then unplug it, the cylinder temperature is going to be the first ones to drop. And the mass is going to be warmer longer. So now you're going to see this line cross back and forth. You could get moisture on your valve, on your valve cover, on the rocker covers, cam if it's not bathed in oil. So this is really something that we're going to stress and I'm belittering the point here, but 240 watts, we didn't put much, not much power consumption, but we get the top of that engine warmer than the oil and the mass. So another, another airframe, different uh, engine, uh, same thing, but more winter type temperatures, things that uh, we can relate to a little bit more when we talk about preheat. If, if the coldest temperature you ever saw was 70 degrees, like the previous slide here, you probably wouldn't be talking to Tannis aircraft because you've got other concerns and issues and it's not uh, operating in cold weather. Here's a 172 that again, we plug it in, you see it ramps up quickly. There are no thermostats. We don't recommend thermostats or timers or anything because again, we don't want temperatures turning on and off. We don't want to see things go up and down below or above the dew point level. Again, we've got this good safety delta between the temperature of our oil. That's the, oh, excuse me, that's the cabin. Little, little secret there, we, we now have a certified avionics cabin heater that we've had since, uh, well, the date's not out here from, I think 2015, 2014 is when we introduced it. So whenever we were doing tests with customers, we'd always throw our avionics cabin heater inside of it to see what that temperature rise we got in the cabin. So that's this pink line going across here. That's our avionics heater. But here's the oil line again. Again, it takes longer to get to its peak. And then you notice it rides the ambient curve. So if this, if the ambient temperature was going to keep on dropping, you'd see this temperature drop also, but it's going to have that delta. You're just going to ride that curve. No, no thermostats turning it on and off. Then for those that are on here that say, wow, that's great, 50, 60 degrees above ambient, I'm starting at minus 20. I need 100 degrees above ambient, or I need uh, you know, much more than that. What do you recommend or what uh, have we tested to do? So here is an example again, where we plug it in, we get the 60 degrees, 50, 60 degrees above ambient. And then at six o'clock in the morning, we put the insulated engine cover on top of the aircraft and made sure there's no air that can go through. And this was in an unheated hangar. And you immediately see that we get additional temperature rise, but you see how much slower it takes. So if I'm in an environment where I need a hundred degree temperature rise, to feel I'm operating in a safe condition, that I should start right away with that insulated engine cover. And you're not going to see it. You're going to have to have five, six, seven hours of preheat time to get it into that operating range. But you'll see this, and we've done many tests, you'll see that you get about another 40 to 50 degrees of ambient temperature. So, uh, you know, the type of covers, insulated covers, obviously. Uh, we, we partner with uh, a, a company that makes them. There are several different manufacturers. A lot of people take horse blankets or anything. The key item is to make sure that wind cannot blow through that insulated engine cover. Cowl plugs or something to stop the air blowing through that cowling is really, really important. And you want to make sure that whatever type of cover you're using stops that wind from blowing in and out of your aircraft engine, because you'll see those air-cooled fins do a very, very wonderful job of cooling the engine. Here is exactly that example. So we had a flight school that went and uh, had several aircraft that did not have preheat systems. So we worked uh, around and got them all installed on their aircraft. And they said, well, OK, what, how, how, what, what do we see as the temperature rise? They had all the same type of questions that many of you probably do here tonight. And 
it, you know, it's, this falls under the category. It's sometimes better to be lucky than good, or it's really good to be lucky and good. Uh, I don't know that we had any tests like this before where this aircraft, it was 172 parked in a very large hangar, very large hangar door, 100 and some foot hangar door open. And the ambient air is probably a 10, 15 knot wind was just blown around outside. And this is the air circulating around in that hangar, going in and out of the aircraft engine, cooling the cylinders, seeing that much of a drop up and down in the CHT temperatures would be or where we're uh, taking that temperature reading. And you'll see later on where we take that temperature reading. But uh, we, and, and we didn't know this, we actually got this back and we're like, well, what the heck was happening until seven o'clock that night? And we called the flight school and they said, oh, that's the time the hangar door goes closed. Boom, we get an extra 10 degrees of temperature rise, nice and smooth. And even the outside temperature dropped. And the amp, when I say outside, this is the ambient temperature inside of the hangar. But you see what a great job those cooling fins do in dissipating heat. So the cowl plugs, uh, even though they you look at them and you say, man, it, you don't think it does much. One of the best investments you can do right away if you're flying someplace and you don't have a generator or power available to plug in your preheat system, you know, just pop those in and you will keep the temperature inside that engine cover for quite some time. So tests, what do we do? How do we, how do we gain knowledge? How do we answer a question when, and we might have some people here tonight that'll ask that, well, hey, what about this scenario? Uh, this was a flight club that had a very unique scenario where they said, Doug, uh, we don't use your, so we use your system on two planes. We use a different system on two other planes. And this is why we think it works. They had a sump only preheat system. We said, we use your insulated engine cover and we, uh, we minute we're done flying, we plug it in, we have that cover inside there. And, you know, we think really that over a period of time, everything's going to be the same temperature in that engine because we're warming up the oil and that, that heat will go up to the top and it will keep that engine very, very close to the same temperature. Well, this is, well, let me back up. You'll see this is our data logging device that uh, my pointer isn't moving. There we go. Uh, we, we take a NIST traceable data logger. So you're going to see calibration labels on here and we put the uh, thermocouple down against the cylinder uh, opposite of where we're heating, if we're heating it. Uh, but this one obviously only had a sump oil heater. So we put one on each cylinder, gather the data, and this is the data that we gathered. You know, we started off, and of course the oil temperature, boom, this is the insulated engine covers on, then we powered it up. Oil temperature jumps up. These are the cylinder temperatures and the top of the case. And you see, and this is with the insulated engine cover on, you see you've got at least 25 degrees, almost 30 degree difference between these two temperatures. And that's with the insulated engine cover. Highly likely that if you left this go for this period of time, when I say a period of time, 24 hours, uh, 16 hours, you're going to see condensation uh, accumulate on valves, rocker covers for sure, on the top of that engine. And for this reason and others, that is why you will see engine manufacturers say, hey, you, you must preheat at this temperature, but don't preheat for more than 24 hours. Reason being is they also seen what happens when that moisture evaporated and they have to be brand agnostic on that. Or we of course don't think they, sh they have to be, but that's, that's pretty much what they've all told us. And we have a very, very great relationship with uh, several engine manufacturers that allow us to come in and do testing. That is the key. So when we go and said, okay, let's take that sump only oil uh, heater off and install a TANIS. We did. And now you're seeing the four cylinder head temperatures, again, 20 degrees warmer than the oil, the temperature riding that ambient curve. If there's nothing else that I move across from this presentation tonight, that is really the key that we want to do. So people ask many times in the presentation if we have uh, 
you know, a, a, a live audience, they would say, hey, uh, you know, Doug, I have that. Are you saying I should rip it out? By no means. You know, use it, understand what you have and use it to the best of knowledge. If I had a sump only engine heater, I would just plug it in an hour or two before I fly and make sure I fly. You know, and if someone, I, we, we get calls, well, geez, the weather turned and I couldn't fly. Okay, but make sure you fly at your next convenience. Don't wait a month. Don't wait two, three, four weeks because a day, several days, moisture on the top of your engine is not going to be a problem. Several weeks, several months, the moisture being deposited on the top of your engine is going to be a problem. And that's why we say get the top of your engine warmer than the oil. And now you have a means of being able to always have that comfort level. So uh, here, here comes a, uh, you know, another, per see how close is to the, the keyboard. So be ready, Laura. The first person that types in, hey, I have a Cub Crafters engine just like that is another winner of one of our swag items. When I say just like that, you don't have to have the Tannis preheat system on there. But uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some slides here that show you what our product looks like, how it's used, uh, what, where it can be installed. So this is a customer of ours that uh, just installed this in the, in the Cup Crafter engine where our threaded element, so what Tannis uses is a threaded element in each cylinder and a pad element on the bottom of the sump for a four cylinder and a pad element on the bottom of the sump and one on top of the case for a six cylinder. And there are some variations from that, but in general, uh, that is our STC system that you would see. So you see that this is the install, this is the location of where we take out an existing fastener and replace it with our threaded element. Uh, that threaded element is basically a stain that starts out as a stainless steel piece of stock, like you see here if you're looking at my camera. We see and see it into a quarter by 20 head for these engines. Obviously, we have some that are metric and then we pot an element inside of that. So we're heating from the inside out. We, we use the threads of that body to conduct the heat to the inside of the engine, inside of where the air-cooled baffles are at. Okay, Doug. So was the person supposed to have an engine like that to win? Nope, just a cup crafter. Oh, they were just... Has a so we have so we have some people that have your preheat installed and people that have a PA12, but they need to have a cup crafter airplane. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay. So the first person that types that they have a cup crafter, <laughs> which, nobody has which nobody's done yet. Okay. So there you go. Steve, you told me I, I, I was going into some deep, deep water. Rough, deep. <laughs> water you gotta know your audience <laughs> probably probably it wasn't a good sway wait until we give away a cabin heater at the end of our show here that okay like a pa12 right. better <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, okay i'm gonna piss yeah, off yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay hurry up get away from that picture <laughs> so and then here is uh an install on a different type of engine again going into the intake tube install. Uh, this is uh, at the factory at Cirrus uh, in their uh, SR20. Here's a D-shaped rocker cover going into a rocker cover install. We uh, can go, it's this exact same element. That element goes into a rocker cover or an intake tube and you, you may use a spacer, aluminum spacer like this right here that we have in, when you're installing it on a rocker cover. Uh, or two of those, and we have those spacers with the kit when you do the install. Split rocker cover, again, here's uh, at the factory. Uh, you're seeing how it's installed on the uh, SR22 product line where they are going into the rocker cover and the wire routing. And uh, the great thing there, and you're, you'll see us talk about it, one of the biggest questions we get is, okay, where do I put the power plug? So I'm gonna to try to address that as we move on through here. But we use one threaded element per cylinder. Now going back to 50 years ago when Pete started it, uh, he of course wasn't heating that. He was using what 
was open on every cylinder, which was the CHD well, or at least three of the four or five of the six were open. So he CNC'd a, a brass body and potted an element in there. We have, uh, we still support that product line. We still, we have customers call us up that have something 40 years old and we still have a product that will make that repair or service. But we vacated that as our standard system because uh, almost every aircraft, if it doesn't have an engine monitor, will probably have an engine monitor in its lifetime before it is no longer flying. So we vacated that CHT well uh, almost 15, 20 years ago. You can still get that. You can still make it if you want to. Uh, we just, you know, when you buy that engine monitor, now you have to move to a different location. So pad elements, uh, obviously on, on always one on the bottom of the sump, but on a six cylinder engine, because of the weight and mass and distance between the base of the cylinders, we also want to have uh, a pad element that's adhered to the case. And it can be adhered anywhere. It doesn't have to be in this particular location, but somewhere on the case to heat up that case, again, to make sure that we're not getting any moisture condensing on there and to get things that are related to that heated. Here's what it looks like on the side of a sump. Uh, this happens to be our uh, engine that we take to trade shows. So it gets used and abused and, and you know, gives, gives you an idea of, of on the side, on the bottom. Uh, this is sticking your head underneath an SR22 at the factory in Duluth. You'll see where they install it there. Uh, or uh, here on the Cup Crafter uh, aircraft that you saw earlier with uh, that. And you'll notice that's the four cylinder pad element. Our, we, we try to make our elements physical size, small as possible, but yet get a very, very long lifespan out of them because there's some very tight real estate. And sometimes when we have to decide where are we going to install this pad element. We also do have threaded elements that go into sumps, such as oil screen elements. Uh, here's this is a superior sump. So putting a pad on the bottom of this doesn't quite work that great because you got the intake crossover there. So we do have some of those. It's not our standard system and not, well, a large percentage of the sumps don't necessarily have an extra. This is a spare port for us or an oil sump screen that's on side there that we can replace it with one of our threaded elements. And frankly, we do like the pad element. Uh, it gives us a little bit more surface area to displace, displace that heat, to conduct the heat into that sump. So the question, where do I put my plug? You know, that is uh, for a new airframe or for some particular airframes, it's the most talked about item. You know, do I leave it dangling? Do I wire tie it here? How do I do it? So we can't take credit for it. So our customers said, hey, I made this type of little circular bracket and I mounted it to the oil fill tube. What do you think about that? So then we do the test, test, do the structural tests. And now we offer that as an item. If you have the long fill tube on a light combing engine, you can buy that kit with us from us. And it basically has all the components you're seeing here, self-using tape to go around the oil fill tube. So the hose clamp basically clamps onto it and will not move, won't vibrate it off. And then you slide our round plug through that so that you can take with one hand plug the extension cord into that location. Another option is again here to, it's on an oil fill tube, but this is also showing that every, every standard kit we have now, our STC four cylinder kit and six cylinder kit comes with an indicator light. And that's pretty useful because many times people think, hey, I've plugged it in and then they get to the aircraft and there's no warmth and it isn't the preheat system that's not working. It's the cord or the power or the, you know, where the, where the connection is and that light has to be on in order for that preheat system to be able to work. We also came out with that avionics cabin heater that we talked about uh, earlier and you've seen some of the uh, data log and temperature maps that we did. Uh, we, we sell it as a standalone device. So that means uh, if you've got a way to run a power cord through your door, through a window, 
something like that. You can just set it on the floor or set it anywhere. It's got rubber, comes with rubber feet and a six foot power cord. You can use it as a portable. Also, as I mentioned, we have used it and got it PMA and certified to be permanently attached to many airframes or basically any airframe that you want to, you may just have to do a, a 337 audit. But here's a case of a PA-28 where it just worked a, a great area to mount it. And then whenever the preheat system is plugged in, the cabin heater slash avionics heater is also working. Uh, let's not go the wrong direction. There we go. That's the next one I was expecting to see. So this is on a Cirrus aircraft. Uh, all of the, most all of the aircraft leaving Duluth have our preheat system on. And now for the last two years has also had an avionics cabin heater. And the reason we show this picture is you will, you'll not be able to find it if you go and walk to a SR-22 or a 20 because it's sitting on this kick plate and that kick plate gets mounted up on this area and then you're going to see here's a thermostat and we actually did that on uh, an aircraft that we were doing testing with because that's an adjustable thermostat most of them uh, are just a fixed thermostat or uh, if you're using it as a portable there's not there's not necessarily a need for a thermostat but uh, some people said well hey i plug it in to i plug your preheat system in to help change the oil in the summertime you know i really don't need my uh, a 100 degree day, uh, an extra 30, 40 degrees inside the cockpit. So we do uh, offer that as a thermostat also. And that's that aircraft uh, with our thermal imaging device, you will see the hangar is five degrees and we just set up, uh, it's a literally a video thermal imaging device that we use for doing a lot of testing. And we just wanted to see what the rise was and you know, we're about 35 degrees above ambient. You're seeing this is the windscreen. The great thing about it is it keeps the windscreen warm enough so that when you get inside the aircraft and start talking on a cold day before the engine even produces enough heat to clear off that frost, you're able to have a clear windscreen. But you'll also notice uh, our preheat system through, this is not on cowl, this is actually the composite cowl on that aircraft. And you can see our heat coming through that composite cowl. So one of the things that we always try to encourage folks is, you know, I'm an engine, I, we're a manufacturer. We're a, we're a preheat system. Of course, we're gonna say ours is the best and you know, here's the things you do it. But what we have really tried to do in the last 10 years is to say, hey, you can confirm our results or we would be happy to do tests with you so that you have data and you can make your own decisions. And what do we mean by that? What that means is, first of all, you need to have good recording equipment. So at our previous company that I own, we had a calibration firm. So when I came here, uh, like, well, we got to have calibrated thermocouple wires. You can't be just taking an infrared gun and shooting it and saying, okay, that's the temperature or, or you, know, put, you know, putting a surface mount on it. So we have a good data logger, making sure our thermocouples are always calibrated. And then we go and place those. Basically, uh, like this particular engine, we were heating, we were in the rocker cover on the bottom over here. So then we go on the opposite side of the cylinder because we don't think it's really fair to be gathering data a couple inches away from where our heating element is. But we will put those thermocouples slide it all the way down so it's right next to the jug. And then we start data logging. You'll see we're using uh, what we lovingly call 100 mile an hour tape uh, there to fix it to places. The one that makes some of our customers get a little giddy once in a while is you'll see here's the oil fill tube. We we drop a thermocouple inside of the oil and and if we haven't had the conversation with the owner ahead of the time of what we're doing, you can get some pretty inquisitive looks of somebody saying you're doing what inside of my engine. So we obviously have to make sure that it comes back out. So we do that and then we usually will let it run overnight, at least overnight or over a long enough period of time so that we can gather data. And then we share the data with you. Or if you wanna do it yourself, hey, you can take things or whatever method a lot of people have developed their own preheat system. Here's a way to be able to gather readings. If you have an engine monitor, you've got a data logger right there. Snap, snap the engine monitor on, 
take a look at what the readings are. You'll know what your CHT is. You'll know what your oil temp is, uh, possibly even uh, ambient, you know, what you won't know or some of the other case temperatures and things like that. But this is something you can easily do yourself and we're happy to go and do it when we are allowed to go back out of our caves again, non-COVID uh, and gather data. But uh, we do many data logs every year to keep on gathering information. And as we change things around a little bit, we wanna see how that works. So this is a case, uh, do it with an insulated engine cover on, do it without, we just set it up, hit record and uh, let it run overnight. Of course, uh, we're gonna get, to, I'm sure there's several people that have a sump only and there's several people that have TANUS and there's several people that have other engine manufacturers. We do get the question quite regularly. Uh, there's only one other multi-point preheat system company out there. And the joke that I heard, and I never did get to meet Pete Tannis, uh, he passed away in 2000, but they always said the best way to heat your hangar or your aircraft was to put Pete Tannis and Bob Reif together inside of your hangar and just have the two of them talk and you'd uh, immediately get everything heated up to operating temperature. But again, we are going to share data with you. So uh, we have some very sophisticated equipment where we can grab a data log and a thermal imaging device. So we took uh, the, this particular engine you're seeing here in our hangar, put our system on one side, competitor system on the other side and said, okay, let's let it run. Let it run for an hour, let it run for three days. And what you're seeing is we have 50 watts of heat going into the uh, cylinders on this side. And this is the band going around the base on that side. Those, Air-cooled baffles do a very, very good job of cooling down the engine. Now, put that engine inside of the cowling and insulated engine cover, and it's not going to be this extreme. But what we're always saying is we want to heat from the inside versus the outside because that gives us the best use of the amount of heat, of the amount of water we're using. And I'm sure their uh, question will come up, well, hey, can I use a generator? Uh, we try to keep our wattage down as low as possible and still achieve the goals that we want. So our four cylinder system draws 240 watts of heat. Our six cylinder system draws 460 watts of heat. So as you can see, a thousand watt generator will easily be able to power that if you're off the grid. Uh, no, we haven't had batteries be real effective. Some people have put battery banks together and solar panels, but it's the wattage, just do the math. Uh, now, when you add our 500 watt cabin heater inside of there, now you're talking a uh, thousand watts or uh, 740 watts. So you, you may get close to that thousand watt, you may need a little bit bigger generator. But I thought I would also, before we open it all up for questions, uh, give you kind of a glimpse of some of the other things that we're working on. Uh, for those of you that have had our product for a long period of time, uh, you will know we always had fuses. Well, our fuses don't look like the fuses anymore. We went with a device that encloses the fuses. Uh, we do have two fuses on our uh, system and people ask, why do you fuse not only the uh, L1 and also the neutral? Well, our wiring harness, when it's going through the factory, it doesn't know if it's going to be a 115 volt or a 230 volt system. Uh, so when it's a 230 volt system, we have to have both sides fused. Even on the 115, some, uh, some agencies, uh, Transport Canada for one, required to have fusing on that side. So we changed that uh, just a couple of years ago, but just to give you the confidence again, we go through tons of tests, rigorous tests, side of a, a heat bake oven, vacuum curing oven, does it outgas, what does it do? We wanna make sure that it is safe because it's an STC product. We have to prove not only to you as our customer, but also to the FAA that this product is safe to be put inside your airplane. We also we get things cold, warm them up. Uh, we don't only work on aircraft. Here's a case of us uh, in, our, in our chest freezer doing a test on another product and we are having problems. We, our heater was doing too good of a job. We had to throw a bunch of other mass inside there to keep it cold enough because we were our little chest freezer wasn't able to keep it uh, keep it cold enough to get our test results but 
you know, we, we make all of our own silicone pads. So we can basically, uh, our tagline is we can make any size, any wattage, any voltage uh, up to, I think, three and a half feet by three and a half feet type of pads. So this is a, a depth system going on um, a diesel generator or a diesel system. Uh, we, we can make various shapes, uh, pumps, transfer pumps. If you need it to be heated, uh, we will go ahead and develop a system or we will add this to something that may be in a uh, rotor wing side of the world. Lithium ion batteries, big, big item now and uh, great, great product. Uh, they're light, but they don't like cold at all. The minute uh, they start getting in the freezing temperatures or below, their ability to produce the uh, amp hours that they were rated at drops off significantly. So we've worked with folks to develop uh, heating up a cage, heating up uh, the batteries so that they, we can make sure they don't see freezing or don't see below zero. What are other things we do? This is the stuff we really like doing. And I know Steve and Laura and probably 90% of the people here on this webinar said, Doug, I, uh, the only reason I'm watching tonight is because I can't go flying that much. And there aren't any trade shows. Uh, we love getting together with folks. This is a couple people in central Minnesota many years ago said, God, we should have, we should, you know, plow because in Minnesota, you have to have the ice houses off the lakes on the last weekend in February. So tons of ice houses all over this lake. And then one of the operators said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just make a wider uh, road for where I'm pulling the ice houses off. You can land planes there. So we started working with that and all these little specks you see here are airplanes that landed there for uh, what was uh, the birth of ice port in Minnesota. Uh, so you're seeing, you know, that's not uh, ground, that's water that those planes are sitting on with insulated engine covers and things like that. Uh, obviously there's probably quite a few people from Alaska. Uh, that's the Ruth Glacier and Denali. Uh, we, we love helping our customers spend our money. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. So uh, if you've got some places to explore, we love to do it. Uh, we, I did also state that we work a lot in the rotor wing side and uh, we had a kind of an exciting moment. We were able to get across the border here a couple of weeks ago and work on this aircraft. This currently is how this helicopter has to be preheated, a, a big, large, uh, burning device that hopefully you throw enough heat in there and it gets encapsulated and trapped inside of here to warm up the turbines and the gearbox, things like that. Our goal, of course, is to be like the Ericsson airplane that you saw earlier, uh, just have a couple cords running to it with uh, generators or powers and, and it still probably have the uh, cover on, especially the rotors, but that's, uh, that's kind of our desire to help that side of it. So and this is this is a reminder more for me than anything else is our cabin heater that we put out and gives you the, again, uh, this is in a, in a 172 about, uh, this is 10, 20, 35, 38 degrees of additional warmth in the cabin. The reason we did it was because of a lot of the avionics, especially old, older avionics don't like cold weather and you could hardly see them when you get older, like a fair number of us, and you can't see it anyway. So you sit there and say, hey, how do I make this brighter? So we came out with that, but this is the creme de creme right now. And it's kind of an unfair question that I'm gonna ask, but somebody's gonna win one of these tonight. Uh, so that's much better than the swag that we have. And the first person to tell me where that is located in the chat box, where does that sign reside? Or where was that taken? And probably Laura, you're gonna to have to go back in and tell me, yes, somebody knows or who does it or where is it? Uh, we will send to that lucky participant a avionics cabin heater. And Laura's talking to that muted. Okay, so a lot of people are saying Lakehood. Some people are saying Glenwood, oh, Minnesota, oh. SMO, Oshkosh. Lakehood got it. So I said person. I said Lakehood, but I sent it. I didn't send it to everyone. I sent it to some random Lakehood dude. <laughs> Well, we'll let, we'll let Laura Gibson, figure Garth out. Gibson is the winner. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, Garth, send, send Laura your email address. She'll send you a private chat. 
And, you know, hey, why not just cut a hole in the ice and jump in for a polar plunge in the wintertime? I invite everybody to come and join us too. You could be one of the, the many that uh, come and have fun when it's wintertime. Here's my contact info. I will uh, stop the screen share here just in a bit, but if you want to write down our contact info, it's info at tannisaircraft.com or numbers, uh, anything like that. Uh, you can do a screen snap. Uh, I'll leave it on there for a little bit, but I will uh, then say, I don't know if there's any questions that I didn't answer, but Steve and or Laura, uh, anything that's in the chat area for questions, I'll open it up or if they so there's yeah so there's been a couple of questions one was uh, an early on question was can they add your battery warming system to like an existing reef system yes yeah if you have anybody's system well so if you add it you know they they use different connectors than we do uh but you know you you can go right to the power cord i think he has a molded power cord but yes you can buy our battery blanket uh, as we call our battery element. And then that does have a thermostat because we want to turn it off once it gets a certain temperature. You don't want to heat your battery up when it's 45 degrees outside. Uh, you know, you only want to be, or, you know, we don't want the battery getting too warm, but you can add it to it uh, or it has its own plug too, if you, you can buy it with that system. But just find a, find a way to tap off the power. Uh, you're, you're looking at 80, I mean, probably the most wattage for a big uh, battery is going to be 80 watts, but 30 to 80 watts is all you're adding to the system, so that that can be added. So, and that's the system you'd recommend for keeping the aircraft battery warm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's uh, you know it's basically two parts. It's you know your different size batteries, so that it it goes wraps around and it actually wire ties. Uh, or you string lace through it to, it's not glued onto the battery, it's just wrapped around the battery. And then uh, the additional item of having either a plug or interconnecting it with our system or anybody's system. So there's another question here, is there uh, any way to use the avionics cabin heater in flight? Well, you have to talk to the folks that generate your uh, electricity. Uh, well, they could carry the generator. They could run <laughs> it on the generator in the back of the airplane. You'll want to get one of those, an extra carbon monoxide detector, yeah. though. I would, I would suggest maybe, that. Maybe. Yeah, that. Great question. And actually, we've, uh, you know, and I, bet, I would dare and bet that question came from someone up in Alaska. Uh, the problem is the wattage. You know, just you know, do, the, do the math. Your 12 volt system, you know, so divide 500 by 12. And your 40 amp alternator or your 60 amp alternator is not going to have any power left to do anything else but try to heat that. So uh, basically, no. We, uh, you know, there we we've, we've are working on some other things where a lower wattage to maybe do some things. But you know, once you start dropping that wattage down, now you don't have enough heat to really make a difference. A couple other questions, Doug. Um, a you know, uh, guy asked if there, is there an upper temperature above which there is no benefit in preheating? In other words, an ambient outdoor temperature. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, so our test, we, we don't test in the middle of the summertime uh, because you know, once your engine is uh, 60, 70 degrees or warmer, there's not a lot of benefit. There's some benefit, you know, you, you have oil temp, things like that. But, uh, you know, we basically say once your engine is at 80, at 70, at 80, you're not going to get a lot of benefit anymore from the preheat system. And again, just remember that delta, you know, 50 degrees above ambient, you know, if it's 60 degrees outside 110, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I, I, probably the question's there someplace. When do you, when do we recommend, the manufacturers say when you must, we see a tremendous amount of benefit once the engine sees anything that begins with four. You know, once you see in the 40s, even lower 50s, uh, once your engine starts seeing that temperature, a lot of benefit to preheating prior to flight. Um, and some guy from Kansas City wants to know if the cabin heater <laughs> provides enough heat for a Cessna 182 battery in the rear of the aircraft. Uh, well, we would recommend not using the cabin heater for that, but using a battery uh, element for that, uh, probably almost the same price because that will uh, you know, wrap around the battery and, and have no 
airflow. Uh, would I, I know he's already got the cabin heater. Oh, okay. He's just wondering if it's going to give enough heat back there in the back of the 182 to keep the cabin warm. I keep the battery warm. 30, 30 some degree. Well, see, it's hidden. That's the other problem, too. In the 182, it's kind of hidden away. So, you know, you, you've got 35 degrees of additional temperature inside there, but you're probably only going to see 20 of it get to the battery, 25, would be my guess. So, we got a, got a few more questions, sir. So, uh, after flying, should you plug in the preheater while the engine is warm or allow it to cool and then preheat? So, uh, this comes out of you know, it's it's much easier to remember to plug it in when you're done flying, and that's what we do. Uh, that's what we recommend. And you know, there's no advantage of having your engine cool down and then warm back up again for preheating. So our recommendation is, yeah, once you're done flying, plug it in. Yeah, everything's at temp, but it's gonna you know the ambient's gonna drop. It's gonna cool things down, but you'll you'll stay at that. 60 degrees above ambient and won't let it get any lower than that. And that's what we, that's what we recommend is uh, okay. easy way of doing it. Unless you've got other means of being able to turn the unit on and off. And that was kind of a lead in. We, we do sell a, a preheat remote device. We got some interesting news that'll be launched out here in the next month about those two. So I, I now, smart enough to look at the chat there and I can actually read <laughs> the comments on that. So uh, battery contact solenoids are notorious for not working in cold weather, any preheat solutions possible. So uh, again, you know, we would, we would do it by trying to heat the environment around there, uh, you know, put in a battery uh, heat blanket, but that solenoid is a ways away from it. Uh, we could look at it. We do not. We have not designed something that goes on to the solenoid itself, uh, but we have in other applications done something very similar to that. Uh, just not something on the shelf, PMA and ready and available right now. Uh, what are your recommendations regarding cellular remote turn-ons? We bought a. a you know, it's, I'll, I'll do a back history thing. We would always test every year every remote cellular type of device and say, here's our recommendations, here's what we see. And there really has only been a handful of companies out there doing it. And uh, you know, everybody asks, well, why are you guys going in? And I said, well, I, I don't have an interest in being in the cellular world because I would be literally be the smallest fish in the ocean when it comes to turning on and off preheat. And because we were able to leave ours plugged in all the time. Well, now we add a cabin heater. So now that 460 watts becomes 960 watts, almost a thousand watts, paying 15 cents a kilowatt. Well, 15 times 24, and you're starting to talk some money. So we said, yeah, there's some good devices out there. And a gentleman that had developed his own in Wisconsin contacted me and said, Doug, you know, I want to retire. I don't want to do this. Would you please buy it? So we bought what was FST LLC, Far Start Technologies device. And we've done some improving on it and we've got some additional items that will go on there. So we do sell it, preheatremote.com. So you can send a text to it. And the, and the great thing about it is, you know, the text, the reason you're, you're able to do it without uh, putting a hotspot in your hangar, for one, hotspots normally don't work because you need an antenna. And two, it's uh, only costs you a couple cents of text. So uh, we went with this when we looked at this one that was, uh, Basically, eighty dollars a year covers you for sure, or you can renew it on yourself every three months. But there's a switch box control, preheat remote, and uh, a newer player that just came on. And James, I see you're, I see you're already in there. Mr. Gallagher says switch on. Uh, Switchy on is a product that just got launched here in September. Uh, Sean and I have talked. Uh, great product. Uh, highly recommend that. Also, uh, it, it takes away some of the uh, headaches that you have uh, if you don't have an app, if you're trying to text certain things to it. So uh, stay tuned, uh, you'll uh, hear more about that. So good plug there, Jim, I like that, James. Hey, hey Doug, uh, a question that came to me privately uh, that, you, you, that you wouldn't have seen is, what's the expected life of the TANIS system with seasonal winter use? 
and does leaving it on for several days at a time decrease the life of the system? So we, we designed everything to try to be in that 80,000 hour uh, range, 80 to 100,000 hour range. So uh, that's all, you know, 8,000 8, hours or something that is basically a year of constant use. So we, we expect to see 20 plus years of use. What you're gonna get is the abuse is gonna be harder on it, the bouncing around. Uh, our number one fail point, people always ask, what, what goes wrong on your system? The, where the wire goes into the plug because the plug isn't firmly mounted someplace. You know, on a, on a Cirrus, it's great because you know, right in the right uh, pilot side cowl opening is a flush mount plug that's stationary there and you can plug your extension cord right into it. But that's the number one fail point on, I'd, I'd see just about everybody's uh, uh, preheat system. And then beyond that, yeah, elements, uh, whether they're installed, whether they're connected or whether they've come loose, uh, you know, we've, we've got a three-year warranty and we have a no question ask. If it's three years and a half, we're gonna cover it. Uh, we just, the product is made to last for a long time. Uh, I saw a chat there, Steve, with preheater and insulated engine blanket and unheated hanger, what is the recommended temp range inside the engine? I'd like to be able to check it during pre-flight? Um, I guess I don't know. So if you use our preheat system and a good insulated engine cover in an unheated hanger, you're going to get about 100, uh, anywhere from 100 to 120 degree temperature rise in the cylinders and about 80 degree, 60 to 80 degree temperature rise in the oil. Uh, so hopefully that helps. I'd like to check, be able to check it uh, during pre-flight, uh, engine monitor will do that to you. I guess I don't know if you have an engine monitor. If not, you at least have an oil temp gauge and you, granted it might say green, it might just be you know, a color, but uh, that's a way to kind of check it. Uh, and oh boy, I, thanks Thomas. Uh, I, I, it, it's people that, so Switchy, I were working with Switchy on and HangerBot, a great partner of ours, the folks over there. Uh, they have come out with a device that basically does the same thing we'll turn it on but they're even going beyond that and giving you video and security and things to be able to open your door and things like that uh yeah i recommend uh you know switchy on hanger bot i wish i could say that uh, you know i would recommend mine because it's better than all the rest i'll say it about the preheat system but uh, that's not the case uh, right now i say uh, james knows it because he's selling a living shit out of it uh, switchy on and hanger bot are the leaders in the marketplace and ours is probably the most rugged. We have the, the biggest amperage. Uh, we're, you know, we went after the big marketplace. And you know, if you have not our our cabin heater, but somebody else's, like a thousand watts, you're going to need our 20 amp preheat system to be able to do that. Uh, my 1981 Tannis works great on 82. See, you know, you you know, whoever. Oh, and this is a guy that won something too, right, David Schlickler. Uh, you know the. The problem with that, I bought the company in 2012. So David, I, I am now in the hole with you because I'm gonna give you some free swag and uh, your system is still working. So hopefully you buy another plane soon, sometime soon. And uh, we, we get a chance of being the preferred preheat person there. Uh, let me scroll a little bit, I think. Really great presentation, Doug. Just, I mean, I learned a tremendous amount. I really like the, uh, the, the, uh, approach you guys use to testing and data collection and all that sort of stuff. That's really cool. And, and I'm certainly cleared up some questions for me. I, I, I did scroll back, Steve, and one, and I should say it because this is definitely important. Uh, uh, Garth Gibson asked, what is the ballpark weight of the four cylinder system? Uh, just over a pound, uh, one pound, three ounces, uh, not counting the circular plug adapter or things like that. Are you going to be able to get that any lighter for these guys? <laughs> so, you know, you, you laugh, but you, you say that, damn it, Steve. <laughs> no, believe should, me, I know him. <laughs> I am going to show you something. We used to have a harness wire that was about this thick and round. You know, this is our late. Now, this is our harness wire. Look at those two combinations. Uh, we were challenged by several customers uh, for lighter, stronger, higher temp. Uh, wire. I will guarantee everyone on this call, you are not going to find a preheat system other than ours with harness wiring that is of this quality. Uh, this is this will meet your temperature spec, it'll meet your vibration spec. 
Uh, it's giving our manufacturing headaches because it's got capped on tape in it. And uh, yeah, sure, we'll work on it just for you, Steve, to, uh, you know, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I heaven forbid, you I leave that wall and it pounds, home. <laughs> I can't lose 30 pounds, but you need to make my preheat system a little wider. <laughs> Uh, well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Doug. And I, I got to, folks, if some of you started over on YouTube and ended up over here, I apologize. A couple times we've had this Zoom crash with YouTube streaming, and I, I, I thought we figured out how to keep that from happening again, but it did happen again tonight. I have recorded all this, so we will get it posted on YouTube probably tomorrow, maybe the next day at the latest. So anybody that missed it can watch it because we have a lot of folks that watched it on YouTube later. But um, but so sorry, sorry about that. If you started on the other platform and ended up over here, at, um, uh, you get what you pay for. <laughs> In this case, <laughs> so, but, uh, anyway, uh, any closing words, Doug? We sure appreciate your time. Uh, I, it's, it's just uh, a breath of fresh air to see a bunch of people together talking about aviation. I'm sure everyone singing to the choir. Uh, we're, we're, uh, getting a little bit sick of what we're dealing with and not being able to go to shows and, and, and you know, as a, as a vendor, and I haven't checked to look to see if there's other vendors on here, you know, we're, we're making decisions of what are we going to do in 2021 uh, and big decisions. You know, we're, we're, we're targeted to be at Heli Expo in the end of March in New Orleans. That's a big show for us. And frankly, as the owner of the company, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's a very expensive show. I, I think it's 50 50 at best and even if even if it does happen and we go in there you're going to have 50 percent of the people there so right. here's to here's to no matter how you voted or what you say i hope there's a vaccine and and herd immunity and everything else that is my christmas gift that i want to give all you and the last comment is uh, uh normally i can't get through my vets statement without uh, choking up. Uh, I'm not of that. And many of you are. And thank you. Today's your day. Thank you very much, Doug. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, we will see you next time. Good night. <laughs>